everyone, and welcome to the Human Design Podcast with me, your host, Emma Dunwoody. I'm a qualified master coach and human behavior specialist, as well as being a qualified human design coach. And I work with clients every single day to answer the big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what is my purpose? I also assist them to transition from the person they think they should be to the person they really are on the inside. I teach people how to actually live their design instead of just knowing it. And if this is something that you want to do too, well, stay tuned or reach out for private coaching or human design unpacks where I show you exactly how to live your design. Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Human Design Podcast. There's someone I wanted to introduce you to. That is another one of our incredible uh, sponsors on the program, our Millions of Millionaires mission. That is to make sure that we do everything that we can to support entrepreneurs and small businesses so that they can create the business of their dreams. So the amazing Heather Ivany is here with me. Um, Many of you might have heard of Heather on our podcast. It was an awesome episode. Um, I probably should know the number off my top of my head, but I don't. Uh, I'm sure that's no surprise to you guys. So go check out the podcast. But Heather, welcome to the to the podcast again. Oh, I'm super excited to be back, Emma. Um, Yeah, we have so much fun when we get together, and you have such. A brilliant audience. So it's an honor to be back in your company again. Oh, thank you. And you're absolutely right. I'm so grateful for my audience. I really am. They are such a beautiful bunch of humans. I'm really grateful. Now, when you actually, we did a session together, I know that your speciality, although you're a spiritual mentor, you have you know experience with yoga, you have experience with the Akashic Records, you have experience with energy healing. I'm sure there's there even Reiki in there. Like there's a list, there's a long list. And one of the things that I know now is a real speciality of yours is purpose. So how do you help people with their purpose? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> when we talk about purpose, there's sort of three main ways that I look at this. One is our, our, our soul has a timeline, right? And it's connected to higher dimensions in the all-knowing realm. And then our soul is also connected to our incarnated self. So it's got this connection to oneness and it's got this connection to individuality. So if someone really wants to work on their connection to consciousness and be fulfilled with their feeling connected to um, the bigger picture, then that's when I work with the Akashic Records with people. I show them how to read their own records. I show them how to read other people's records. And then you can even go into the Akashic Records of your business, current events, plants, animals, anything that has a consciousness has a record connection connected to it. And then if someone is more um, honing in on like, what is the purpose in this particular lifetime that I'm in? So their incarnated purpose, I work with a program called Unlocking You. It's also a three-month long program, same as the Akashic training, but this one's designed specifically to help keep people from being distracted by the periphery, give them tools to hone into their midline, and then amplify their purpose and help them to fulfill it in this lifetime. Oh my goodness, that sounds so exciting, far out. And so what what do they learn? Are they they is it Akashic Records? What else do they learn in that program? Yeah, so the Unlocking You program. So what I've done with that one is I've taken sort of the 25 years of teaching yoga and I've taught multiple different types of teacher training programs. But what I did is I I pulled from the philosophy of the wisdom of, of these thousands of years of yoga and pulled out like what are the tools that everyone can benefit from if they want to be more connected to themselves. So we work with intention that is like more powerful than just um, an affirmation or wishful thinking. I show people how to really hone in on how to work with intention at certain times a day. So it's more amplified. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And then phrase it into like a positive I am statement because I am state I am is the language of the universe And it's the language of present moment. So those two points bring us into um, a very amplified experience of intention. Mm. And then inevitably, when someone's wanting to shift and change and transform, resistance is going to show up. 
So we, I show um, individuals how resistance is actually your ally and not your enemy and how to work with it to create opportunity and change. We create boundaries because most people have really strong boundaries with other people, but maybe not with themselves, or they have it with the human dimension, but they don't have it with the energetic dimension. So we work with boundaries in those three ways. And then we also play with meditation in a form that is personalized to the individ individuals that I'm working with. Because um, meditation can be, for some people, just walking barefoot in nature. And for others, it's like a 40 minute transcendent experience. So I just let it be very personalized. I love and then that. rest is the final element because we get so excited in this human form that we forget that it requires rest and cup filling and nourishment. So I work with Yoga Nidra to show people how to amplify the rest space. Wow. I love all of that. And as you were talking through, like so much of that resonates as well. You know, um, I love how you are making it sort of unique to the each individual that's part of the group. So can you share the sort of results that people are getting? I know that for me personally, when we had our session together, I was blown away. Like I was blown away at what you what was shared with me and what the results that I got is that instant like oh my god I can trust this I can really trust this subtle energy that I get this feeling this knowing you know keep going um so for me it was really profound in that place are there other results that you might be able to share some other stories yeah so sticking with the unlocking you program um oftentimes when people start to really hone in on themselves and their aligned purpose they become more confident and courageous to make changes in their life. So I've had um, individuals go from, she, one woman was an accountant that um, eventually moved into doing, um, uh, becoming a doula for, for palliative care, which is beautiful. Yeah, wow. Uh, I've had individuals, one woman went, she's a clinical psychologist and she moved from um, working in sort of a, a system-based um, employee situation to being able to branch out on her own and create her own private practice. And then in that she offers Akashic sessions within her counseling session. So it gave her more freedom to express um, her healing energies in the way that she felt more authentic to herself. I love that. Um, so those are some of the results with the Unlocking You. And then what's most fun with the Akashic training is people get really nervous before it starts thinking, oh, what if I can't do this? Or what if I can't read someone else's records? Um, I've never had anyone go through that isn't able to read the records by the time we're done. And so that alone is mind blowing because a lot of people think when they're in sessions, healing sessions, they think that it's some sort of a gift that someone has that makes them able to be able to work with energy in the way that they do. And honestly, it's it's a skill set that just needs to be honed in on and practiced mm. and consistently practiced and it's curated and sort of pulled out from the individual and expressed. So I love those transformations. And then the third signature program that I have is called Sovereign Leadership. And this is working with um, the energetic realm <clears throat> to support the entrepreneur that wants to amplify their income. So I've seen people go from 5xing to 10xing their income per month just working oh, with that yeah the resources that are around them yeah yeah oh my goodness that sounds um, I feel like I want to sign up to all of them I uh, I'm just I'm all in with with you Heather you've been such such an incredible person to work with um I'm also like I really want to have a session and let's look at my business's Akashic records that sounds so exciting so <laughs> How can people get in contact? Obviously, we're going to put all the links in the show notes, but how can people find you? Yeah, the best way is just to go to my website and it's simply my name, heatherivany.com. That's the easiest way. All of my programs are on the homepage there under the little tab offering. Um, most of them start in September, end of September, early October, and they'll repeat in the new year as well if, if it feels a little bit too rushed for anyone starting soon. Um, I also have a retreat in November um, in Cellulita. So this is for the individual that has done a lot of the growth work and just wants to be in the experience. So it's called Harmonize and it's working with nature. It's working with um, 
body movement, meditation, Akashic, fire ceremonies. You don't have to be an expert in any of them. You just have to have a willingness and a desire to want to attune and harmonize to your own heart song. So that's in November. And wow. then the other way people can get in touch with me would be through Instagram. Um, and it's just my name, Heather underscore Ivany. So yeah. Oh, amazing. Well, people, you have to go and check out all of these programs. The retreat sounds amazing too. I feel like I want to go on every single retreat that I speak to, like all the people in my world. I'm, I want to go there. I want to be on all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you, if this has lit your fire, if you're excited, if you're curious, if you're a little bit obsessed with Heather, like I am, go and check out the show notes and find the program that's going to suit you. Thanks everybody. Thanks Heather. Hey, hey everyone. And welcome to today's podcast. I'm really, really excited to introduce my guest today. Um, and we're going to be talking all about food and the bad habits around food and the mindset around food and how it has such a massive impact the way we um, think about it, consume it, attach it to our, our identity um, and all of those really cool things. We're even going to talk about hormones because as you guys know, I've had a little, I've been doing this experiment with my own hormones. So I'm going to get Amber's um, excellence or uh, expertise on that as well. So welcome, Amber Rom- Romagna. You got it. Woohoo! Did it. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm super excited to talk to you. And um, this is our second conversation. We had a human design conversation on your podcast, which was awesome. I felt like we could talk forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would really love you to share with my listeners your story, you know, like how you got to where you are today. Like what was the the catalyst? And before we dive into that, I just want to let everyone know that Amber is a 3-6 splenic manifester. So let's listen for her speaking her design as she tells us her story. Go ahead. Right. It's it's so fascinating. Such a puzzle with the human design piece. So yeah, for me, you know, what really created my business now, nine years ago, I've had started my business was really this deep self-sabotage with my body, with food. There's just so many aspects of it. So I struggle with food addiction, binging and binging and purging for a few years, like really intensively where my weight would be up and down 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds every few months, Um, you know, going from the all or nothing mentality all in just, you know, needing to be perfect on the diet or the eating style. And with the workout six days a week or falling completely off, going into the binges, the rebellion, the screw it. I messed up. So I'm going to eat everything I wasn't allowing myself to have. And that cycle was just so vicious and exhausting. And, you know, it really created that, you know, dynamic was when growing up, like being bullied and told I was fat and ugly on the bus when I was five, like that just hit my heart so hard. Oh my God. Um, I totally yeah. resonate. So I was, I actually remember the kid's name and I won't say it on, on the podcast, <laughs> but, but a kid literally called me fat. Like I was at the drinking fountain and he said, move over fatty mm. and same deal. I so resonate with that, that, yeah. um, binging as, as well. And that like all of us, I'm an absolute saint stick into all the rules, all the other extreme. I'm, I'm loving this. Please continue. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I do jump in. No, no, I get over excited. I love it. I'm the same as you. No, I think it's great. It's, it shows your like connection. So, um, so that was really a pivotal point that really made me create my identity with body and food for the next 20 years of my life. And I grew up and my mom who was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis before I was born, she had a food addiction. She had a hoarding issue and a a very deep, like unworthiness piece. And so like, obviously it wasn't her fault, but growing up unintentionally, like a lot of what we did together was revolved around food to compensate for all the activities we couldn't do together because of her fatigue, her dizziness, and some of the symptoms that were just starting to like expand and get worse as I grew up. And so I thought it was normal to just sit and watch TV and eat like three cookies and two chocolate bars, and then have an ice cream and a piece of pizza. And like, there was never any quantities with food or like mindfulness. Right. So that just made me assume that this is normal. I'm probably just going to end up being overweight. Like my mom's side of the family, because That seems like the genes that I have, right? Like we're taught all this genetic stuff that is just honestly not true. Oh my God, it's not true. Right? It's such limiting beliefs. Um, 
And so then I grew up and got into my teens. And then of course, you know, I started watching music videos and purchasing CDs and becoming obsessed with Hollywood and all the like magazines. Right. And then you start comparing your body and you're like, what's wrong with me? How come I do not look anything like that? And then we start beating ourselves up and the the unworthiness is developed. And so I really chronically dieted and unconsciously was emotionally eating all through my, from like five to 20, but the binging and the, the real deep self-sabotage started when I was about 21, I'd gone through a breakup, couldn't eat, lost weight really fast, was obsessed with my body, but lost my period, became so critical and so arrogant. It didn't fix anything. It did not make me happy. And then one day I couldn't manage it. It was not attainable to be, you know, restricting to the intensity that I was in working out two hours a day, seven days a week. And so one day I just got so triggered and I binged and was at a barbecue. I'll never forget. I ate like three pieces of ice cream cake. I stole the chocolate that was for the s'mores and went to the bathroom and ate it. And then on the way home, I'm like, well, I might as well get something else since, you know, I'm not going to do this again for a long time. So that all or nothing really got triggered. And then the next day wanted, went to the gym and freaked out and was like there for three hours trying to work it all off. And that really started consciously that all or nothing binge restrict cycle on a very deep level. Um, and I really struggled with that for probably about four years where it was just, I was up from my lowest to my heaviest weight gain, like 80 pounds. So ashamed, wanted to hide at home. And when you're in your early twenties, like you should be out living your life. And I was hiding in shame. I had a crappy job in retail, hated my job, never had money. in My bank account was always avoiding looking at it. Cause it was in the red, such lack mentalities, didn't know how to cope with stress or any of this. Like I was just not equipped at all and it's no one's fault, but it's like the universe just threw me in the deep end. It's like, okay, you're going to have to figure this out. And I finished a binge and I was just laying on the couch thinking like, I'm being really destructive toward my body, like physically, mentally, emotionally, energetically. I'm actually afraid I'm not going to make it to 30. Mm. That was just such a, something hit me where I was just thinking, I don't know how much longer my body can handle this. Do you remember how old you were when you had those thoughts? Yeah, that was 21. Yeah. Wow. That is just, it's it's crazy. And one of the things as I'm listening to your story, I mean, so many things sort of um, popped up and resonated, but I've just had this real aha moment, like my cycle, um, through the the binging and then um, uh, restricting, because it wasn't as as extreme as yours, I actually didn't look at it in my 20s, let's say, or even in my 30s um, as a problem. And as Mm. I'm listening to you, I'm like, oh my God, it's almost like that subtlety that, that, that I could talk myself into, this isn't an issue or this isn't a problem. And I'm even aware of it today. You know, I'm still aware that there is a pattern and I don't listen to the ego but I still am aware of there's this pattern that's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, you've put on weight. Oh, you've lost weight. Yay. And even to the Mm -hmm. point, like I'm never sick. And this year I've been sick a couple of times. And every Mm -hmm. time I'm sick after it, I'm like, Oh, look at you. You've, you've lost weight. And in that moment, I'm like, Holy crap. Like I'm really aware of those things. And I'm grateful that I've been on a journey to be aware of it. But even just hearing you say it, I'm like, wow, it mustn't be completely healed because there is still a whisper of it. Um, you know, not that I'm overly acting on it, but there's still that whisper of it. So I think that the story that you're telling is really, really powerful. Um, and that, you know, on so many levels and also that comparing, you know, that moment mm-hmm. where we sort of look out to the rest of the world and go, well, I don't look the way the rest of the world looks. Yeah. One of the questions I want to ask you, and this is definitely um, kind of from my point of view, I don't feel like I've ever been a person that looks has looked outward and really overly compared myself. However, there, especially in my 20s, there was like, although I wasn't saying I don't look like that, I would definitely feel like at a certain weight, I felt uncomfortable in my body. And I would tell myself, well, when I'm at my correct rate, weight, then I will feel better in my body. And over the years, I'm like, oh, that's just a story I'm telling myself. But I'd really love you to sort of talk to that a little bit because I think that there's a bit of confusion in there. And I know there definitely was for me, um, you know, in the past where I would tell myself, well, I'm not actually comparing myself to others. It's how I feel in my body. But is it really how I feel in my body or is that just a reflection of my mindset? I think there's two parts to this. So I think there's a part that is 
I truly believe we all have a natural set point that we will fluctuate, but that is very easy for us to maintain without restriction, without cutting calories, extreme diets, extreme eating styles, or insane exercise that you dread doing, but you feel you have to for fear of gaining weight. We all have a natural set point. However, what helps us to get to managing that is none of the above. It is about seeing that weight as a protective mechanism. So if my body doesn't feel safe, she's going to hang on. And ha- why does she do so well? The negative self-talk, the picking yourself apart, the comparing, the overbooked schedules, the people pleasing, right? The overgiving and having blurred boundaries, the perfection, all or nothing mentalities, the hormone issues, the gut issues, the inflammation, like the overeating and then restriction, like all of these things plus more accumulate and cause such an overwhelm in the body that she doesn't feel safe. And then she hangs on and protects until we are willing to look at dismantling and exploring all these layers and pieces and actually taking focus off of weight loss and onto a healing journey, which is like body, you're speaking to me. Like, I want to listen to you. I want to make peace with you. How can show me how to do so? And then she leads you with that. So there's that aspect of it. I do think that it can be innocent to go like, okay, my body's feeling a bit off. Like when I was at my heaviest, I was not binge eating, but it was my hormones and inflammation that were a nightmare. And I was resisting slowing down my exercise for fear of gaining weight, even though I was gaining weight like crazy. Mm. But when I started to realize like intuitively, I know I'm like, I know this isn't my natural set point. I know it's probably a lot less. However, like I'm going to love and nurture my body now. Cause this is where she's at now. And I need to own that. I did this to myself and I take responsibility that. I think this is one of yeah. the really big pieces that for me in my journey with loving my body that it was the game changer is exactly what you yeah. said is like we have to love our body where we're at I think this is you know of all the things we talk about in this year in this area I think this is one of the primary um, focus points we need to have is like love where we're at whatever that mm-hmm. physical body looks like love it where it's at and I think that's where we start to um, to navigate and you know, like you say, heal. And I love what you're saying about that conversation. And I want to actually go back to um, like hormones and inflammation in a minute. But what I want to sort of just touch on as well is that this ability that our mindset has to really warp the way we look to ourselves. One of the stories I tell a lot um, and probably not on this podcast, but in my behavioral coaching I used to use this metaphor or this story a lot to really help people understand the power of their beliefs. And that was that I had a belief that I was fat and I would constantly, every time I looked in the mirror, all I would say, I would joke about it. All I see is hips and thighs, you know, like (laughs) a big ass, big thighs, you know, and one day it literally dawned on me. I'm like, oh my God, I wear a size eight. How big can they really be? And it was that moment where I really realized that my mindset and not that I really believe reality is reality, but my reality, they weren't matching anymore. So I'd really love to hear your feedback on that. Like how can people kind of catch out their ego like I did, um, you know, to see what their their mindset is telling their body as opposed to really starting to listen to their body, if that makes sense. Totally. So to me, the ego in the head is really what's going to cause you to be critical, picking yourself apart, comparison, going, you can't until you're below this weight, you can't live your life the way that you want to, you're not going to make enough, you know, as much money or get the clients or the sales or grow your business or career if, until it's below this level, you need to restrict until you're here. Right. Um, so there's that to me, that's like the ego, which is the negative thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors around food, even that are not in alignment with like, the heart, which to me is the, I have, I know I can learn to love myself. Maybe I'm not there yet, but I'm open to like learning and understanding. And I'm open to catching my ego and catching the first sensations physically and emotionally and going, there's my ego. Okay. I'm sorry. I said that, like, I'm going to try to compliment myself and work through the discomfort of being nice to myself because I'm not used to it. That's heart. And that's to me, one of the ways we start to make peace with our bodies and build self-love as we work on all the other pieces I mentioned earlier is awareness around catching the ego, taking our power back and going, okay, how, like, how would I treat a friend? How would I treat a child and and giving that to myself? Yeah. I love that. I I think that's so powerful. Like how would we treat our best friend? How would we treat our kids? Mm -hmm. Um, I remember when I was going through this journey and learning to love myself and doing the um, Louise Hay, you know, Mm -hmm. mirror work. And I literally couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I could not look at, let let alone tell myself I love myself. 
um, I couldn't look in the mirror. Uh, and it took me probably three months before I could actually actually do it without, and I was still doing it with massive discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, and now today, every single time I go in the bathroom, I'm like, hey, gorgeous. Or hey, beautiful. Oh, I love you so much. Like it's this yeah. constant conversation. And I feel like people really need to understand that it's a muscle that we build. It's not something that yes. just turns up magically one day. It's a muscle that we build. Yeah. But I want to, I want to ask you a couple of things um, and you can, as a manifesto, you can go where you want to go first. I'm really curious. Number one, I want to talk about um, inflammation and hormones uh, and how we can know if, um, how can we reduce inflammation and balance our hormones or even know that our hormones are out of whack. And the other thing I want to really um, understand with some deep clarity is like, how do we know what our natural set point is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the natural set point, I find it's easy to maintain. So we may fluctuate, you know, five to seven pounds and not that you need to be weighing in, but you can tell by the way your clothes fit. And maybe it's like, okay, for the women who are, you know, in their period, it's like a couple of days before you're noticing, okay, things are fitting a little bit different. Or maybe you go on a vacation, you indulge more, maybe you retain a bit more water, but as soon as you come home or you, your period's over, you're through the menopause stuff, like the retention settles down and it's, it's easy, but otherwise it's super easy to maintain and you don't have to exercise. You don't have to diet. You can actually be in a balanced, mindful relationship with food in your body, but you could rest. I rested wow. my protection off because my hormones were so to whack and I was so inflamed. I did not lift a finger with any exercise. It was like self-care walking, gentle stretching, but like tapping meditation, energy work, like really connecting on a deep level. And that's what I teach my clients. And that's what happens for them. And it blows their minds every time because they've been so conditioned diet exercise. So that's yeah. natural set point. It's easy to attain as soon as you have to force with, okay, I've got to do a certain amount of exercise every week, right. Or your period disappears, or you're all of a sudden feeling really tired, what you're trying to force weight loss. It's probably not the aligned place. Oh Does my that God, help with that I love question? that. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. and I think it's so powerful because I was the same. I was so addicted to exercise. Yeah. Um, and I am a manifesting generator, so I do need to do a lot of exercise, but I have this balance within my chart. In fact, I'm going to quickly look at your chart as I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cool. So I have a right arrow in my environment. So do you, which, which means that I actually have a passive body. So there is an experiment that I need to do because my body actually likes to sit down. I was having a a joke with my friend Liz the other day and um, she has a standing desk and I'm like you're so designed for a standing desk and she's like oh my god you've changed my life I now walk and do my <laughs> sessions or I'm standing at my standing desk and I'm like for me it's the worst thing ever like the thought of a, mm -hmm. of a standing desk just makes me want to vomit um, but that's because I have this passive body so I have really had to learn to trust with the exercise and that sort of thing less is more and I've actually mm -hmm. recently started with a PT and uh, as I said, I've just run in and my, literally as we're talking, my legs are shaking. Like we worked really hard, but we didn't do much. And it's yeah. really been this amazing transformation for me because I've pounded my body for decades. And mm -hmm. last year we didn't do anything because we were traveling around Australia in a caravan. We hiked, we swam, we surfed, we did all of these things, but there was no formal exercise. And I was like, hey, hang on a second. How come my body is exactly the same doing this compared to doing nothing? And I... I love what you say. And I think it's so important for all the listeners to hear is that forcing weight loss, because the moment we start to force, then we're not listening to the body. We're not listening to the feedback. And, um, and, you know, I'd really love your wisdom on that. Like, I really do want to talk about inflammation and hormones, mm -hmm. but I also really want to talk about building that relationship with the body, like listening to the body. How can people, I mean, especially because you're a, um, a three, six, you have had so many experiences and you're at this time in your life now where you're creating real wisdom. I would really love like, how do our listeners actually, what are the practical actions they can start to take to fall back in love with their body, to trust mm -hmm. their body, to hear the feedback that it's giving them um, yeah. and specifically around exercise and food. Because I know yeah. for me, um, one of the things with food is that I can be, um, you know, I can really be down on myself if I eat two pieces mm. of chocolate sometimes. And I'm like, oh, there it is. I'm just in my emotional low and I can let it go. But it's taken time for me to get to this place where I'm like, I'm just going to eat what I want, what, what feels correct. 
Um, And I wouldn't say I'm perfect at it, but could you really help the listeners with practical ways they can start to build the muscle, to listen to their body, to know what food to eat and how to exercise? Yeah. So first we need to understand that if you have a really muddled relationship with food, that needs to be addressed first. Because if you're binging and emotionally eating and think intuitive eating is going to work for you, I'll be honest, it's not. Because your ego is running the show and going to go, oh yeah, you're craving donuts and candy. Like that's what you need. And that's BS. And that's not how intuitive eating works. Intuitive eating to me in my experience only works when you're so dialed in and so in tune if you've healed your relationship with food. So wow. We that, I just want to like highlight, that. if I could highlight that right now, I just want everyone to hear that, that we have to do the work first so mm-hmm. that you can connect to the intuitive eating. I think that's such an important point because so many people get muddled there. Sorry, please. Continue. No, no, that's okay. So we have to understand, like, if I'm coming from fear, unworthiness, like the need to fix my body and use food as a control mechanism, whether it's to numb and suppress my emotions or to lose weight, I've got to deal with that whether it's emotional eating, binging or binging and purging, you must address that first. And what you can start with is before you go to the food, is this physical or emotional hunger? Do I get a hunger signal? Is my stomach growling? Has it been a few hours since I've been starting to build awareness around physical versus emotional hunger and emotional hunger is any reason for eating other than physical nourishment, fear, worry, fatigue, dehydration. I ate a bunch of sugar yesterday and now I want more. I'm bored. I wasn't present with food and now I want more like starting to build that awareness first. So that's one piece. Another one is to be aware of the intent behind why you want to do the exercise. Again, if it's fear, need to control my body, need to control my weight. Society tells me this is what I have to do to fit in, blah, 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 blah. That's to me misaligned, mindless movement versus yeah. mindful is like this lights me up, it makes me feel good. It boosts my mood. It gives me energy. It's It meets me and my body where I'm at now and how we start to figure out what kind of movement is in alignment for us now physically is looking at your hormone health, is looking at inflammation and gut health, is looking at your emotional state with your body and food. So there's, as you're hearing me, you know, there's different layers to look at to help you get to the point of awareness of what's going to be in alignment because what works now might not be in alignment in six months as you heal. And so as far as how to eat, well, to me, it's really addressing the relationship of food, undoing diet mentalities and, you know, restrictive behaviors that you may have taken on and learned from different diets and eating styles, addressing any food fears you have, because that's one thing I'll say with keto. I've had so many women come to me that are now afraid of a carrot an apple, a bell pepper, such nourishing and healthy foods, but because keto put them into such an all or nothing perfection mentality and made them fear carbohydrates, Mm. we've got to undo that. So they feel safe actually eating what are basic foods. So there's yeah. all these like diet mindset pieces to address, to build that, you know, what should I eat? How should I exercise? Um, it's very layered. And then your hormone health is going to dictate the way you behave with food and your mindset too. Yeah. I think it's fascinating. So when I did, when did the, the keto, it was you know, fundamentally to balance my hormones. I am, Mm. I can tend to be a very all or nothing person. So when I try something, I'll go all in. Um, And I did feel better for a while. But one of the things that I thought was really fascinating um, was that, so I'm a person who I will literally crave vegetables every day. You know, I've just always been that way ever since I was tiny. And all of a sudden I just couldn't face a salad. Like I couldn't face all of this healthy food because it was like, such a drama to try and eat. Um, Mm. And I feel like that was one of the really big things that, that actually didn't work for me with keto was that whole, Oh, well, you've taken all the fun out of it now. Like I can't just enjoy, you know, and, and let go. Um, What I'm really curious about, and maybe you, you do, or maybe you don't know a lot about this. One of the things that fascinates Fascinates. me, whether it's keto or a lot of these things is a lot of the research is actually done on men. There's very, very little research, especially with keto. There is no Mm -hmm. research directly done on women. And the, the book that, that I followed, which I actually think is really good. And, you know, now I've sort of worked out that what I can do is, you know, I'm keeping the high fat, low carb, but not as low, low carb. And one of the greatest lessons from keto for me is don't do everything at once. You know, like I was doing keto, I was fasting and I was drinking bulletproof coffee. And it was like my entire body ended up with shingles, like total Mm -hmm. inflammation, total stress. It was like all too much. Mm -hmm. But what I now have really done, you know, typical line three is I take, I would probably eat keto maybe 60% of the time. Um, But via my human design, it's given me some really great indicators, you know, like I've got a hungry brain. So 
um, which is a left arrow in your PH, sorry, a right arrow, sorry, left arrow in your PHS. Um, and what that means is that when I'm working Monday to Wednesday, I eat, you know, almond butter and honey on toast. Like I will eat that for breakfast. Whereas today I've worked out, <clears throat> I actually haven't had any breakfast yet. Um, and not for any reason other than I wasn't hungry. I didn't need the food. Um, so I suppose what I'm really asking you is, what is your experience with, we go out to experts to try and, you know, solve our, our problems, but what are the things that we kind of need to know? And I suppose you've kind of answered this, but I'm really curious, like how can we become more dialed into our body's feedback? Uh, healing your relationship with food first and foremost, because you cannot for the life of you pay attention to and understand your body when you're shoving your intuition down, you have all these symptoms yelling at you, you're overwhelmed and stressed fighting with your body, making amends with your body and, and building self-worth, bringing balance into your schedule so that you, you need time to deal with these things and yeah. heal and become in tune with your body. So, you know, overcoming people, pleasing, setting healthy boundaries, opening up time and space for self-care, good sleep, mindful eating practice. All of these things are important. As we do that, we become more in tune with our symptoms and why we're having them, but we need the time and space to be able to reflect and check in. If you're go, go, going and hustling all the time, again, you're going to be in frazzled chaotic energy and you're not going to be able to tune in. And then you're going to be making all these decisions from a stress reaction. Yeah. I also think it's really important to understand what kind of hormone imbalances, gut imbalances and inflammation are going on and where they're stemming from, because that's going to also help you identify your, your cues and the way your body's speaking to you and why she's speaking to you the way that she is by having that kind of understanding. And so that's to me, how we build that, you know, being more attuned with the body and really understanding the signals is opening up space, healing our relationship with food and body, and then really looking at the physical, you know, symptoms that have been heightened by all the self-sabotage. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. So how do we find out? Like, is it a blood test? Is it a, how do we find out about the inflammation and um, hormone, you know, imbalance in our body? Yeah. So definitely testing can be very helpful. It's also important to look at symptoms as there's many very obvious ones that can be very correlated, but to make specific recommendations to help lower inflammation and address specific hormone, you know, and gut imbalances, definitely testing to just affirm where numbers are at. Cause the severity of the imbalance can dictate the kind of protocol. Um, but I believe in gentle all the way. I won't do anything invasive with my clients because I've had too many horror story experiences that people have shared with me and having big, insane reactions from doing too much too fast just yeah. has too much of an impact on people's quality of life. And it's not fun to have massive detox and get sick and all these kinds of things. So with harm, so with inflammation, um, C-reactive protein is an inflammatory marker that you can test for. However, this, the, the problem with testing is that the normal range is too big. And often women are having symptoms in the normal range. So for me, I find there's a sweet spot where it's actually normal, but everything outside of that is an imbalance, even if it's in the normal range. And so that's where like, don't just necessarily rely on your, you know, primary caregiver to do testing and like go in depth with you because they literally look at it, scan it and go, yeah, everything's good. Even if things are out of the normal range, they'll just look at it and say, everything's fine, which I think is kind of ridiculous, but yeah, you know, um, I see that all the time with my clients. And so looking at inflammation, signs of inflammation are water retention. We can retain anywhere from five to 20 pounds of water alone. It's yeah. not all fat. There's a lot of retention, warmth, feeling warm in the body, um, waking up in the night, sweating. It's not just a menopause thing. It's definitely an inflammation thing. Um, you know, pain. So if you have old injuries that are, you know, flaring up, you get headaches, bloating, cramping. Those are all signs of inflammation, redness. So eczema, psoriasis, skin breakouts, redness on the skin of any kind is another sign. So we have heat swelling, which is the retention, redness, and pain are all signs of inflammation. And I know a lot of the women that come to me retain tons of water. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the more gut issues we have, the more inflammation we have, the more hormone issues we have, the more inflammation we have, the more emotional eating we're doing, mm. the more inflammation we have. So with hormones, wow. so yeah, it's, it's, it's just, so deep. And it's just like a, it's a, such a, a big cycle that we can get trapped mm -hmm. in, you know, and I'm listening to you and I'm like, almost like I can imagine this little tick box going, yep, had that, had that, had that, had that. Don't gratefully not feeling a lot of that right now. <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> But I think that this is, this is really cool. So 
if we have these sort of symptoms, are there simple things that we can tweak now? You know, like if we, if we're retaining a lot of water, is there something simple that we can do to help our body um, to not be retaining that water in a healthy way for us? Mm -hmm. Drink enough water, get your eight hours of sleep, try to be asleep before 11 PM because optimal hormone balance time is happening between 11 PM and 1 AM. And if we're awake during that time, you will retain more water because your body's in a more heightened stress response, you know? Oh my God. I love that. I've just got to jump in again, because this is something that a GP told me years ago, like over a decade ago, she's like, it's the hours before midnight that count. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard the biohackers talk about it. And I'm like, "Mm, is that a woman thing? And that's why they don't talk about it. So I'm, I think that's really powerful, really important. I know how important sleep Mm -hmm. is for me. Like I'm an eight hours girl, you know, when I get eight hours, I'm, I'm a, like really happy human when I don't I'm not so I love that that we need to understand that between 11 and 1 is what's really helping us with our hormones in our sleep Mm -hmm. that's bloody brilliant and inflammation because if you're awake during that window you're going to be more puffy and inflamed the next day too and your dopamine and serotonin are going to take a hit so your mood's going to be lower your focus is going to be lower like it has a significant impact um again addressing your emotional relationship with food because that is amplifying and like it's like you're throwing gas on a fire. It's just fueling the inflammation so significantly. So, and, and starting with self-care, like breathe, meditate, get out for a walk, like get in the backyard and ground, put your feet in the grass, start with simple things like that. Even just 10 minutes a day. It's, it's just about starting small and building small habits. Um, but this is like simple things that people can start with. And if you're going, well, I'm doing that and nothing's working well, time to look more at your hormones and, and deeper at these emotional pieces, because there's, you know, we can even try to do these simple things and sometimes they may not feel like they're doing anything because it's just so intensive and there's so much going on. And are there certain life stages where people might, it's more common to experience certain um, challenges, you know, like in your twenties, thirties or forties? So to me, it's all based on the way that you've been taking care of yourself, your stress levels, your relationship with food, because that all dictates your hormone levels, your gut health, your, your mindset, right. And your emotional state of mind. And that's what all dictates the level of imbalance. So no, because I've had clients in their twenties have like absolutely horrible hormones and inflammation. And I've also had clients in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies in the same place. And it's all in the cycles that they've been caught up in, in self-sabotage that have been amplifying it. Yeah. So it's just like when they tell you, oh, as you age, things decline, that's such BS. Like that's such a limiting belief to plant in people's mind. Your body's always trying to heal. It's just that we're getting in the way. Yeah. I love that. And I want to talk a little bit more to that because um, I think aging is something that women, like we, we, and I think it's probably the, like the weight thing as well. We really unconsciously deal with it. I've never had a problem with aging whatsoever. I'm like, I'm sweet. Mm-hmm. I'd much rather get older than not, you know? <sighs> um, and when I experienced early menopause, it really impacted me. You know, there was all these things that um, honestly, I feel like it was a lot of intergenerational stuff as well, but I would just love to hear that you know, and it was Dr. Christine Northrup. I read Mm -hmm. one of her books, uh, you know, goddess at any age, I think it was called. And I was like, all right, cool. This, this whole aging thing is between my ears. It's not, you know, as Mm -hmm. long as I'm telling my body um, that I'm, you know, um, I'm healthy, I'm well, I'm vital. Like they're the things. And, you know, I like to partake in as much of play because I also felt that play was something that slowed down the aging process. Mm -hmm. Um, what are the things in your uh, experience it's really going to help us make peace with the aging process? Because as women, we are so highly conditioned to fear mm-hmm. aging. Um, and, you know, like I'm 47, I'm quite fine with telling everyone ha- how old I am. But there is definitely this part of me now that's like, oh, look at my puffy under my eyes. Or, you know, I'm conscious of wanting to have more even skin tone or, or, or my skin's not as as tight as it used to be. And although I know I can't turn the clock back, you know, back to my twenties, I do know that as long as there's this internal clock, and I know that we do operate from two different clocks, like our actual age and our physical Mm -hmm. age. Um, But I would just love your expertise, like on aging, how can we age gracefully in your experience? Mm -hmm. Lower inflammation. That's what causes the hair turning color more quickly. That's what causes a lot of the wrinkling and the, and the skin elasticity. It's part, part of its collagen, but part of it is the inflammation and the hormone imbalances and and the more extreme those are, 
the more quickly the body declines just because she's in a heightened state of stress. So addressing those things are important. Like healing your relationship with food, right? I think dealing with the conditioning, stop giving attention to the companies and the programming and the TV shows that are pushing that aging is bad and shame on you for being this wise, beautiful woman who's 47. Like you should be getting all the stuff done to not age. It's like, no, it's a gift to age. I agree with you. I will be so grateful if I'm wrinkling and all the things are happening because I'm here still and I'm living. So I think part of it is really being aware of where we, you know, develop this conditioning from Hollywood media, TV, family, where, where we inherited it and starting to let go of it and deprogram it, whether it's EFT tapping or certain visualizations and affirmations and meditations, visualizations, whatever it is, but we have the opportunity to deprogram and unfollow people on social media that are triggering you and and content stop consuming it as well because the more we consume it the more we're planting these images in our subconscious mind and then we make it wrong yeah that we're going through this natural process that we will all go through and hopefully have the gift to go through yeah I think it's so it's so beautiful you said that and I think it's really important for everyone to hear like stop consuming the media like I have not I mean I've never really read gossip magazines it's not not my jam, but, um, you know, even fashion magazines that refuse to (laughs) stop airbrushing and that sort of stuff. Mm. Like, I'm just not interested because I know how important it is, you know, what we put in, um, into our mind is what we're going to, you know, create in our reality. So we have to be so, so super aware of that. You know, I think the, one of the things that's really kept me youthful and young and will continue to keep me that way is number one, not giving a shit what other people think. Um, and doing that via, and, and that's, that's not to say that I'm like winning at it hundred percent of the time. That's the other thing mm. I really want people to hear like 70% yeah. of the time, 80% of the time, maybe even 85% of the time. I don't care what other people think. And that's yeah. enough. I think the next piece for me is, you know, and this is where human design comes into it is when you're being your authentic self, it's so much easier. It's so much easier when you're being you, everything is easier. You know, you can hear those body the, you're giving you feedback. Mm-hmm. You can trust that today, yes, chocolate is good for you. You yeah. can, um, you know, have more flexibility in life because you're really aligned to who you are and expressing yourself authentic- authentically. And, you yeah. know, one of the other things, and I mean, I've always been a pretty healthy eater, um, even though I've had this really weird, you know, I learned very young uh, being an MG. I have always eaten more than everyone else. You know, my husband is like a foot taller than me, if not more. (laughs) And um, he eats about a quarter of what I eat, you know, and he's a projector. So I've always been this really big eater, but I did learn as long as I'm burning the calories or I'm having fun. And this is the next piece to aging that I think is really important is, you know, at 47, I ride a skateboard, I surf, I, um, you know, I'm playful. And that's one of the yeah. things that I notice as soon as I drop the ball on being playful, that's when all of a sudden I feel inverted commas older because I feel like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I'm, I'm in my conditioning. I'm, I'm acting yeah. my age. I don't want to act my age. I want to, you know, <laughs> act my heart, you know, my yeah. heart age. So I think that that's really important through the process as well. Um, yes. Sim- really simple things that people can do to reduce inflammation. What's your advice? Hydration, getting the sleep. So asleep before um, 11 PM, eating mindfully, addressing emotional eating, self-care routine, maybe starting with 10 minutes a day to start regulating your nervous system. Because if that's overwhelmed, you'll be more inflamed, lymphatic, dry skin brushing, a hot and cold shower. These are really simple things that you can start with, but just pick one thing and start building a habit. Don't try to do 10 things because then you'll get overwhelmed and you'll give up. Yeah, start I love small. that. Um, I want to ask about the lymphatic brushing. I did that for quite a while and I was kind of like, is it doing anything? Can you tell me a little bit about what that's doing for my body to reduce yeah. inflammation? So the lymphatic system is the garbage removal of the body and it will often get stuck. It comes out of the back of the head, drains into the, you know, underneath where our lymph nodes are under our, by our neck and then down the neck into the sides of the breast, the armpits and down into the groin. And it gets stuck really easily for a lot of people. Number one, because we're our other detoxification systems, our circulation are sluggish, our metabolisms are more sluggish because we have thyroid and cortisol issues that are going unchecked. Um, we sit a lot, right? A lot of us have jobs where we're sitting a lot. 
And so it slows down and, and you can tell it's slowing down. If you get lots of tension headaches, especially the back of the neck and the traps, you're feeling fatigue, brain fog, low energy. And then you're again, retaining a lot of water. Like my face used to be so puffy and it's not a judgment. I just look back in photos and go like, wow, I didn't realize how backed up my lymph was until I looked back at a photo a few years ago before I started doing drainage. And now, and it's like night and day and I'm the same weight. Wow. So, um, and I was getting tension headaches all the time, going to the Cairo acupuncture, all this stuff. And like having to go so much, I started doing dry skin brushing and hong cold showers, like multiple days a week. And it literally went away. That's how stuck my lymph was. So, oh, the, that's so the good. dry skin brushing stimulates the system and gets the lymph moving to get the garbage, you know, removed out of the body. So it's not stuck in building up everywhere. Um, and you can get a dry brush and you can look at videos on YouTube, but always do toward the heart. And then I love the hot and cold shower start, you know, with lukewarm, if you're a little bit nervous about going colder, but you get used to it. And it's the most invigorating, refreshing thing. Cold calms inflammation, helps regulate hormones. Oh my God. I love that. Love it. I do it every day. Yeah. I love it. And it's really funny. You know, um, I, last year in the caravan, we we're having cold showers all the time because we'd be in the middle of nowhere and we'd want to save our hot water. And, mm. and, you know, we were constantly in the ocean, like everything was just cold all the time. Um, but I, I love that. I think that's so powerful. And the simplicity of what you just shared, you know, like tension headaches, like feeling that tightness in the neck, like, yeah. um, and you, I've definitely had that over the years and I've gone for the massage or I'm like, okay, I've done something but no, it's potentially, it's just that needs cleaning out. So are we dry yeah. brushing morning and night? Are we just doing it every time? Can we do it a few days a week or is it more better or doesn't it really matter? Once a day, I find if you do too much, you can over detox and then that can make you feel sick. So just ease in gently if, a few times a week. If you, if you love it and once your body adjusts, you could always do it every day, but perfection doesn't exist. So do what feels exactly. good. Yeah. So that's what I suggest, but ease in slowly. Cause what I by accidentally did when I started, I was dry skin brushing, hot and cold shower, rebounding on a trampoline, infrared sauning. And I pissed off my gallbladder and I was so nauseous and I had like reflux and like was exhausted and I overdid it by accident. So ease. In. Oh my God. I just I didn't know. That. And then it hit. Of course like, you did because on? you're a three, six. Oh my God. Yeah. You have so, to bump yeah, into stuff gentle. and make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> Tips for sleep. How do you, what's your recommendation to improve our sleep? Um, disconnect from technology 15 to 30 minutes before bed. The blue screens are stimulating. And if we're stimulated, we're producing more cortisol and that's your stress hormone. And the more of that you produce right before bedtime, you're suppressing your melatonin production, which is the hormone that makes you sleepy and helps you fall asleep and stay asleep. So a good sleep hygiene routine is important. Um, also making sure that you maybe want to get into some self-care before bed to help regulate your nervous system. If you are having serious troubles falling asleep or staying asleep, definitely get your hormones tested because there's likely one or multiple imbalances that are going on. As an example, if you're having trouble falling asleep, that's a sign your cortisol is too high before bed. And it should be the lowest before bed. If you're waking at midnight, high cortisol, if it's two to three, that's liver issues and three to four is thyroid. So the sleep cycle and where we're waking is really trying to communicate with us and tell us what imbalances are going on so we can address them and resolve them. Um, lavender on your pillow or, or chamomile or some kind of relaxational essential oil can be really helpful. A chamomile tea in that late afternoon, you know, so you have enough time to pee before bed, but Again, simple things to regulate your nervous system are great places to start. I love that. And um, I follow a bunch of biohackers. We take a bunch of supplements. We do all sorts of crazy ass stuff. What would be your recommendation for women um, for great health? Like, do you recommend any certain supplements or any protocols? What's your advice on any of that? Yeah. So for me, I don't really recommend anything specifically because each person who's coming to me is so different and I don't believe one size fits all. And some supplements it. can hurt people and help others. And I went through that and I, you know, so it's really hard without knowing someone's health history to make those specific recommendations. I will tell yeah. you, I want everyone on a good probiotic that is a high dose of, you know, multiple strains because we all need it because our flora is so sensitive. 
Otherwise, it's a very specific to each individual woman. Um, and same with protocols. I don't really have any specific protocols I like to push because most of the women coming to me are struggling with their relationship with food. And most of those protocols are restrictive and only amplify the issues with food. So it's yeah. healing the relationship with food, small integrations and changes with adding in more foods, teas, spices, and some vitamins that will help the unique person and self-care and nervous system calming tools. And then as they heal, okay, then we're going to go in and gently support your liver. We're going to gently balance your gut flora. We're going to work a bit more on this hormone, but nothing restrictive and nothing invasive because otherwise we suppress our immune systems. We end up, you know, exhausted and over detoxing and not fun to be in that place. Oh, it's so beautiful to hear this. You know, I feel so grateful to have this conversation and for my listeners to hear it um, because, you know, you just, you're preaching to the converted. I love this whole concept that it's, Let's just go down the road with each individual and support them um, mm-hmm. on their journey. And I love that the easy does it, I, you know, like easing yourself into it because, you know, from a behavioral point of view, that's how we create change. We actually don't yeah. create change by forcing ourselves to do things the hard way. Um, yeah. In fact, our body just finds ways to avoid it. So being able to, you know, get into things a little bit slower more gently is building a long-term habit and long-term habits is what actually creates change and transformation. So it's amazing. Agreed. Wow. I'm like, Oh my God, now I need to sign up. I want to like (laughs) get my blood done. I want to check it out. Um, I wish you went all the way over there. I wish you were here in Australia. Oh, we Um, can ship testing to you. It's all good. I have clients all over the world. I just shipped some to Peru today. So that's not an issue. Oh my God. To Peru. I love that. (laughs) That's so cool. So where can everyone find you, Amber? Yeah. So my website is amberapproved.ca. I have a free emotional eating quiz there. If anyone's wondering if they're struggling and I do offer, if you want to connect for a 30 minute body freedom or biz freedom call, cause I coach a lot of women struggling with biz and body. Um, you're welcome to do so there. I am on Instagram and it's my name, Amber Romaniuk, R-O-M-A-N-I-U-K. And my podcast, which I'm so excited to have you on is called the no sugar coding podcast and it's available everywhere. I love that. I'm so excited. I'm just going to ask one more question because I haven't asked about yeah. it. Sugar, because you just reminded me. Um, so I've done, we have someone, I don't know if you would have heard of her. There's an Australian here um, who's done so much work around this for a long time. Um, Sarah Wilson. She Matter. was oh, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so, you know, sugar has been a big conversation mm. um, here and I've definitely gone through the whole, I've never been a huge sugar addict, whereas my, mm. my husband is totally addicted to sugar. He loves his sugar. <laughs> what, what's your advice on that? Like, is it a all or nothing or is it a little bit the same? Like a small amounts is okay. There's certain types of sugar. Like I sort of learned, like there is no such thing as good sugar as long as, you know, and then we've come full circle. I'm like, if it's sugar in fruit and you're eating the whole fruit, then that's okay. What are, what are your sort of guidelines around sugar? Yeah. So for me, refined sugars, like white sugar, cane sugar, brown sugar, corn syrup, things like that. I really do try to encourage my clients to like lower their amounts as we work together. No restriction. We replace them with natural alternatives so they don't feel restricted, but because for them, they're getting such mass dopamine hits and highs from the sugar. It's fueling their food addictions and their self-sabotage with food. It's fueling inflammation. It's suppressing their thyroid. It's feeding the unhealthy bacteria. So if you have an unhealthy relationship with food, address that first. Do not try to cut out a bunch of sugars and cut things out because that will fuel rebellion. And then you'll keep going back and, you know, continuing to binge on it. Right. That's important. Um, And then as you heal your relationship with food and we add in more alternatives, because to me, there are good sugars like monk fruit, stevia, you know, depending on your digestive state. Some people are good with erythritol, some aren't, but those don't spike the blood sugar. I find too with raw honey, maple syrup, coconut sugar, maple sugar. Yes, there is still sugar in it, but it's not giving the same massive blood sugar spike and dopamine high, like the refined sugars. So to me, there's a happy medium and everything in moderation. The more you heal your relationship with food, the less inflammation you have. And then as we go in and balance your hormones and your digestion, I find most of my clients can have mindful amounts of you know, sugars and refined sugars, because they're now in mindfulness, it actually doesn't appeal as much to them because it's too sweet. Their teeth ache, they get tired. They don't like the feeling. So I think everything in balance, I believe in balance with food where you can enjoy mindfully nourishing your body for health and energy and vitality. And that you also should be able to enjoy a mindful indulgence, even if it has refined sugar, gluten, dairy, something that you don't have all the time, because that to me is balance. Otherwise we're going in perfection and all or nothing. And that to me is not balanced with food. So that's my, oh my God, on it. 
But yeah. I'm in love. I'm in love with you. I love your ethos. I think it's so incredibly powerful. And I love that the answer to every question has been heal your relationship with food. Mm. You know, I love that. It's such a feminine, like the divine feminine um, way of addressing this, all of this, you know, instead of like that masculine, let's just fix it, you know, do this, don't do that. It's getting to that root cause. And I think that's so incredibly powerful, you know, you know, yeah. no restriction. And as you were speaking, one of the, the shifts that I did on keto, as I say, I'm not a huge um, sugar fan anyway, is I switched to 70% chocolate. Mm. And now I literally can't eat any other chocolate so because it's, yeah. it's too sweet. Like everything's yeah. too sweet. And, you know, and again, that's, oh, my, I love my body. My body is doing the work. It's doing that, mm -hmm. that reset for me. So I think that's really powerful. Thank you so much, Amber. This has been awesome. I also feel like I have 50 more questions, so I might have to hit you up. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for your time. And thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. It was honestly a pleasure. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. I trust you got so much out of that. Um, and I look forward to having you on the next podcast. Bye for now. Thanks everyone for being here all the way to the end of the podcast. I hope you got lots of value out of it. I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Could I please ask that you share this podcast with friends if you found it valuable? And also bonus points could you leave a review for me as well on apple it would be greatly appreciated if at any point you would like to be on the podcast or you've got questions that you'd like me to discuss on the podcast by all means get on my socials and dm me everything you need is there in the show notes have an awesome day bye for now